spirituality and the concepts of God were always there, but not really in depth the way I would have wanted it, you know, like mm. some questions I would ask, I wouldn't really get clear answers. I'd be told, don't ask, just believe. It's all about faith. And I think for us in our generation, you kind of want like clear answers and evidence. I knew that there was something out there and there was some knowledge beyond our understanding or our consciousness at the moment. But it's just finding out how to get into that. And so I go home and then my mom sat me down and she was like, Ian, I have something to tell you. I went to hospital mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, the doctors kind of had a scan and they checked me out and they told me I've got cancer. I was like, oh my God. God, and I got so depressed. So I was just thinking, oh my God, you know, as soon as something like that comes, you know, we all go through adversities in life, right? So as soon as something like that comes, immediately you think the worst. She's gonna Bye. die, Bye. then what? So I started like trying to numb myself with getting higher and higher and higher. But then I was also at the same time inquiring higher and higher. Like I asked God while I was in my room and I just asked God like, if you truly exist, like you say you are actually like, you exist within this world. Why do you allow bad things to happen to good people? Ian, welcome to Millennial Minds. Oh, I'm you. so happy to have you here. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's no, amazing. I have, um, you're someone, this sounds so creepy, but you're someone I've watched for a long time and just thought like, I want to be friends with you. Because oh, yes. I see you at the temple. And on a Sunday, you're one of those people that are like dancing and you're free, you're grooving yeah. and you're just having so much fun. And I look at you and I just think, wow, he's just so happy. Yeah, no, You're so legit. free. And then it was weird because we eventually got to meet and I was like, you were the guy I've been looking at at the temple. No, no, <laughs> so it feels really surreal. I'm really nice to have you no, here. Thank you for having me. It's amazing. And I mean, that's a space, you know, it's, it's super fun and we're having such a great time and enjoying ourselves when we're in the temple. So of course, and then you find the energies that you want to vibe with. So it was right. automatic for us from the jump. It was. <laughs> so I want to talk to you about your journey into becoming a monk. Mm -hmm. um, because I've I obviously know your story in, in terms of what you did before, but for the people who are watching and listening to this, tell me, you know, from the start, were you always interested in becoming a monk from the age of like three? Mm, so, you know, when I was younger, we had elements of spirituality in our home. I was born and raised in a Catholic home. So like spirituality and the concepts of God were always there, but not really in depth the way I would have wanted it. You know, like mm. some questions I would ask, I wouldn't really get clear answers, I'd be told, don't ask, just believe. It's all about faith. And I think for us in our generation, you kind of want like clear answers and evidence. So I was always kind of skeptical of, you know, how, you know, religion was presented to me when I was uh, younger. So I kind of went through that like spiritual phase of like, you know, smoking weed and kind of like exploring things this is when I got like high school. Right. And um, I knew that there was something out there and there was some knowledge beyond our understanding or our consciousness at the moment but it's just finding out how to get into that. And so, mm. but I always was a seeker. I always, you know, wanted answers. I was always kind of like inquisitive about like, you know, there has to be something alternate within this universe and something much more higher than ourselves. Then when I got to uni, so I, I was, I'm born and raised in Kenya. And right. um, I decided to come and study and do my degree in marketing at the University of Kent in Canterbury. Mm -hmm. So then I got to uni and I was obviously, the, it was wild card time, isn't it? Like partying and, you know, but still kind of, connecting a little bit so I made a dealer friend and then I was always going and smoking weed with him and okay. you know kind of having like those deep existential like discussions and stuff and um yeah then randomly he brings me a book you know we're just chilling and we're just like getting high and then he brings me a book and he tells me yo some monk gave me this book from the street and stuff and he said he was a monk but I didn't believe him but he said he was a monk and he said if you read this book it's gonna give you some mad realization so you read it then tell me what he says and then he gave me the book and it was the Bhagavad Gita. And then I look at the back of the Bhagavad Gita and I see a picture of one of our founder. His name is Srila Prabhupada. Yeah. I see his picture and I was even ashing on his face. And then I was looking at the paper, you know, because it has like that thin paper. And I was thinking, we can use this to smoke. Why do we need to like, <laughs> it was weird. That's like, that is so heartbreaking to hear. I know, Using I know. the Gita to smoke. Yeah, exactly. But then somehow I kept it packed it in my stuff, then went back home to visit my family. Okay. And when I flew back to Nairobi, I was planning all these things because I used to be in the entertainment industry before. Right. So we had planned like, you know, a couple of appearances and shows and stuff like that with different groups. But then I got home and then my mom sat me down and she was like, Ian, I have something to tell you. I went to hospital mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, the doctors kind of had a scan and they checked me out and they told me I got cancer. Mm. And then she was like, um, it's not, it was breast cancer, but then it's reached stage four, so it's moved to my lungs. And I was like, oh my 
God. And I got so depressed because it would just hit me out of nowhere. I'm actually, I'm a mama's boy. My mom like raised me really like single-handedly. My father was never really around in my life. Mm -hmm. So I was just thinking, oh my God, you know, as soon as something like that comes, you know, we all go through adversities in life, right? So as soon as something like that comes, immediately you think the worst. She's going to die. Then right. what, you know? So I started like trying to numb myself with getting higher and higher and higher. But then I was also at the same time inquiring higher and higher. Like I asked God while I was in my room and I just asked God, like, if you truly exist, like you say you are actually like you exist within this world. Why do you allow bad things to happen to good people? You know? Right. And I was like, my mom's here. She like serves everyone. My mom just doesn't serve m me and my sister and my younger brother or like our nuclear family, but serves even other people outside the community. She likes to help so many people. She's the one who's getting cancer. And I've got one uncle of mine, her brother, who's like an alcoholic, drinks like anything. One time we got a phone call. <laughs> right. Um, and some guy says, oh, do you know this person? We just found him on a ditch. Um, and he seems like unconscious. Can you, we're going to take him to hospital. Right. They take him to hospital. They say, oh, he's smelling of some local brew. And then they pronounce him dead. So we think, oh my God, we're obviously getting emotional. My uncle's dead. And then he wakes up like 20 minutes later, starts speaking in English, which he never used to speak in English before. What? Yeah. <laughs> and we're like, what the hell? So we're all obviously freaked out. The okay. doctors scan him and they say that everything is okay with him. Like his his liver and everything is fine. Hold on. He, he, he was pronounced dead, came back yeah. to life, and then spoke a different language. Exactly. You know, legit, no cap. <laughs> Started speaking English. Like, what say you, say me? You know, it was very, very weird. Probably something okay. had happened on TV. So okay. I was just like, that's happening to my uncle. And he's like been drinking his entire time. But my mom, who's been spending time trying to serve others mm. and actually be good in this world, mm. is the one getting diagnosed with cancer. So I was like, mm. God, if you exist... Tell me what's up. Because I can't understand you from what the world is showing me. Wow. You show me yourself. And then I was scrolling on Facebook. And then I see a picture of a lady. And, you know, she had like uh, this mark on her face. And, uh, you know, she just looks so peaceful. Right. And she, uh, her picture was posted by one of my all-time friends. Her name was Stephanie. Uh, so I messaged Stephanie and I'm like, hey, Steph, I saw you posted a picture of this lady. Shout out to you, Steph, by the way. <laughs> you know, lots of love for you. Um. So I was like, you posted a picture of this lady and she just looked so spiritual and zen and I'm trying to be zen. Right. So can you give me some tips? And then she tells me, I can't make you zen, but I can give you the absolute truth. And the first thing you need to know is that you're not this body. You're the spirit soul. So I was like, that's pretty interesting because my mom was going through chemo and everything and her body was like, you know, suffering in so many ways but she was still jovial and happy and enthusiastic mm -hmm. so i was like who's having the enthusiasm when the body is going through so much pain mm -hmm. it must be the soul mm -hmm. and then she invited me to the temple i went and i started like you know learning about it this is in nairobi we have a temple right. there and then they were answering all my questions deeply you know and like nothing wishy-washy about faith but like scientifically about how god is maneuvering this world and how he's within this world and he's without it a lot of technical science and it's oh, all yeah so so sorry just on that you're saying a lot of give me an example so basically okay one one amazing concept about the divine is that the divine made everything that's existing mm -hmm. but he made it in such a way that we who are here within this place have some independence to kind of maneuver ourselves without his influence but under his sanction. So it's okay. like he's within this world, but he's without it. Got Does it. that make sense? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So stuff like that. And, and there's so much complexities about it. Um, and it's coming from a scripture. So right. I started reading the books and then I immediately read this book and it was talking about vegetarianism. Then I became vegetarian immediately. I was just like, I'm going to give up eating meat because animals also have got a consciousness. And so I was like, why would I, you know, Eat, eat, eat something that's got consciousness like mm -hmm. I have. Mm -hmm. So it just changed my mindset. Then after a couple of months in, I was like, I need to give my life more to this. So I flew back to the UK, um, carried on with my studies, then ended up finding the monk, found the monks here. And then after that, they invited me to the temple. And I decided my next summer holiday, instead of me going out on holiday, I'm actually going to spend time at the temple. And so I dedicated like two months, which turned to five because I was so into it. And then, yeah, I just decided, I think after I graduate, I'm going to give a cohesive amount of time to wow. this practice and just soak in as much knowledge as I can because this knowledge is not being publicized to the world. So I need to kind of absorb it for myself, then make a choice about what I want to do with my life. Yeah. So your mom was still going through cancer and she's still going through chemo and treatment. Mm. 
the question you posed at the beginning of this was, if there is a God, why do bad things happen? Yeah. And why do bad things happen to good people? Mm. Did you find clarity on that? I answer? definitely did. I definitely did. And obviously, there's a, it has so many layers to it. But yes, I definitely got to understand how you know, the Lord is observing us and is sanctioning different things based on what we've been desiring. Right. And some of our desires are immediate. Some of our desires are extended. So, you know, like if you're planning, you know, you have a vision of where you want to be like 20 years from now. Mm -hmm. You've got a vision of where you want to be right now. Mm -hmm. And you've got multiverse desires. Then we've also got different opposing energies and elements that are coming through us and uh, that are coming to us as well. And some of them are good. Some of them are bad. Some of them we are good to, some of them we're bad to. Right. And so based on like a deeper calculation of karma, because this is basically action and reaction, mm -hmm. um, certain things are happening to our bodies, certain things are happening to our minds, certain things are happening to our, our, our endeavors in life. So some people will, you know, you can get like two kids. Right. They're both studying the same amount of hours, yes. both doing the same amount of revision. But when the exam comes, one's getting 50%, the other one's getting 100, mm -hmm. you know, but they've been presented the exact same um, opportunity, but they're okay. all getting different results. So it's based on one's um, karmic uh, calculate, uh, calculation, you could say, that they get what they desire at specific points. And some of it is good. And with good, there's always bad. It's kind of like a yin-yang situation like that. So the, calm, the, the karma that you're talking about, is that from your previous life? Some of it could be from your previous life, of course, yeah. So I've heard um, some, not monks, but I guess some people who claim that they are priests. And this is a very controversial thing that one of them said. Mm -hmm. Somebody, um, he was like a guru, and he was speaking, and he said, all of the bad things that happen to bad people are because of the karma in their previous life. Mm -hmm. And somebody said, well, what about my disabled son? And he's yeah. like, there's his karma from his previous life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very hard to accept. It is, it is, it is. It's, it's hard to accept, especially when your vision of reality is only in the now, mm. you know. But for a monk or a person who's connected deeply with spirituality, we realize that this journey didn't just start from now. You know, like there's um, Ian Stevenson. He does this whole study on regression. Wow. And he finds out that there's children from different places. A study you can look up is amazing that um, have they can recollect things that have happened in different circumstances, in different times that they never even existed in, you know? Um, oh. And, you know, so like there's one kid who is in one part of India and he's talking about something that happened in a different place in India at four years old and it's so clear and direct that the parents were just stunned so they take a trip and they go there and they check it out and they realize everything the child was saying is true. So there is that understanding, but one can only appreciate it if they realize that they're more than this body, that this is just, you know, the analogy is given like a car, right? Mm, like, I've heard you know, this. Right? So like you're in a car and you're uh -huh. driving your car. Let's say you're driving like a, let's manifest a Tesla, right? Because <laughs> I'm still a monk anyway. <laughs> in that vibe. But let's say we want a Tesla. Yes. So if I enter the Tesla, I never say that I've become a Tesla. Of course. But I'm in the Tesla moving from point A to point B. And then I can get out and get into a Range Rover and move from point A to point B. So similarly, in this life, the soul has gotten into this form and is moving this form from point A to point B and has been moving different forms from point A to point B before and will be doing so after. And that's why then the element of eternality comes about. And so we realize a lot of the things we're dealing with, even the body that we have, is our, a decision made from our desires and conditions in the past. And so right. some of it might have been good, some of it might have been bad. And so based on how things might have happened, you got into that situation in this life, you know? So wow. all the good and the bad that we ex we're experiencing in this life is actually coming from that, like, divine calculation based on our mm. past experiences like that. Wow. You know, it's so interesting that you speak so passionately about this, but I can't help but think that when people kind of start the spiritual journey, mm. you were Catholic, you weren't religious, you used to take drugs, you used to drink. You then changed your path very quickly in terms of who you wanted to become. Mm. Was that hard for people around you to accept? Because a lot of people are very scared about becoming too religious. Right. Or too this or too that. You know, people say a lot, you're too much. Mm. And there's a form of like extremism when someone is very passionate and when they dedicate their life to a particular cause, whatever it may be. Yeah. People see it as a form of extremism. I just spoke to a doctor last week, Dr. Jim Newman, and we were talking about veganism. And people see that as a form of extremism. People find it really frustrating and people get angry when you tell them they're vegan. Mm. So when you turned around to your, your mom or your family and said, I'm becoming a monk, I'm changing from being a Catholic boy to now being a Hindu. Mm. 
what was their reaction? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I, as soon as you even just, you know, talking about that, I was just envisioning. I remember my mom's face when I came home from the temple and she had told me not to go to the temple again. Yeah. And um, I came in with some books and I had them hidden under my sweater thinking that, oh, she's not going to see me anyway. So I'm just going to have them under my yeah. sweater quickly and then run up. Rush, run up to the room. And then I got to the door and I opened the door and she saw me and she was like, where are you from? And I'm smelling of incense because I was in the temple, of course. And so I'm smelling like very, very spiritual. And so she's like, mm -mm, there's something here. And I was like, I was just chilling with my friend. Then one by one, the book started dropping from my, sh <laughs> from my shirt. <laughs> and she looked at me and she was like, oh my God, really? These guys have brainwashed you. Yes. You know, they're changing my son. Right. And this is the thing. As soon as we do something different, everyone thinks that you change as a person. You know, and change is inevitable. In our lives, we're always going to change. But this change just seems a little bit too drastic and too immediate and too weird that um, people just find it difficult to digest mm. because you approach it with so much enthusiasm, so much zeal, so much, um, you know, you know, it's super fun. Yeah, right. for, yeah, you know, it's super fun and you're enjoying it. And so they think, whoa, it's happened so fast. He's not, re has he really done a SWOT analysis? Like, what are like the threats? <laughs> you know, like all these things. But then when you're approaching a philosophy as powerful as that of the Gita, you know, that doesn't give you room to, or even when you speculate it, like you get your clarity because everything is so direct and clear. You, you, you are going to have that enthusiasm. And I'm sure you've probably experienced it when you find something yeah. with so much clarity and you know that it's working out for you. It doesn't matter what anyone says. You kind of just go for it. And so right. we kind of have to have the balance as individuals. Okay, we go for something enthusiastically. But spirituality also makes us conscious. You know, mm -hmm. I, I break down the word spirituality in th with, three, with three words. Spirit, ritual, and reality. So you identify that you're a spiritual being having a human experience. Then you take to certain types of rituals and that ultimately changes how you view your reality and changes your reality. So as you're going through these changes, you become conscious of how you influence your environment, how you influence your family. And so, you know, you treat them with more love and attention because you understand where they're at. So, you know, I, I get that my mom was feeling, man, um, I'm losing my son. So I had to step up and give her that assurance that, mom, you're not losing me. You know, I'm the same year nanny that you were changing diapers back in 98, 99, you know. Um, I'm the same kid and I, I still love you. Because at times also family and people feel like, oh, they're not going to love us anymore. They're going to judge us because they're living a different lifestyle. I still love all my mates, you know, who probably are still drinking and eating meat and doing all the things that I'm not doing. Um, you know, I don't judge them based on the changes but some people do that that's another problem yes. right some people become extremist with something then they criticize everyone else <laughs> exactly but it's supposed to make you love others more that's spirituality if if it's making you judge others more then there's something wrong with how you're applying it you know like wow. that. so what exactly is a monk mm. one way we can understand um, a monk is a person who's dedicated their time to introspection to focusing on the inner world you know, they decide to cut themselves out from the conventional um, values of the material life or like of normal everyday life mm -hmm. and choose to focus within and focus on internal values, focus on controlling the mind, focus on controlling the self, regulating our body, regulating our eating, regulating our enjoyment to figure out who the inner person is. That's how I describe a monk. Wow. Like that. Okay. Um, it feels like you really found your purpose. Definitely. How do you recommend other people find their purpose? Because I do believe that when something tragic happens, when something difficult happens, we turn to kind of a revelation, you mm. know, and so many of us have that. When you're going through a really tough time, something clicks and you think, I have to make a change. But there are a lot of people who aren't going through tough times, yeah. but would like to make a change, but don't know where to start. Mm. How do people find their purpose? Yeah, it's amazing actually you said that and you bring that point because even in the Gita, it explains that um, one of the, the, there's four types of people who seek spirituality um, or who kind of try to find, in trying to find meaning, mm. turn to spirituality. And the first one is one who goes through super, uh, lots, lots of distress. Yes. So like distress is hitting you like anything and then you just think, okay, I must turn to something, let me turn to God. Right. Then um, the second one is a person who's trying to get money. So, you know, they're try I'm trying to make money and it's like, you know, I'm just like, okay, I need to get into the grind. Something's not working, but someone to make can turn to God. Boom, let me turn to God. Right. Then you find those who are just open to just seeking spirituality, 
you know, let me just find out, you know, these people are talking about this, but they look a little bit mm. interesting. Let me just find out what they've got. Mm. And then you've got the, the fourth person who is actually actively seeking the absolute truth. So, um, you know, we'll, there's different levels, you know, everyone, uh, and all of them are accepted and appreciated as jump starting us to take into spirituality. Now, you're talking about individuals who maybe were not seeking anything per se or weren't like triggered to, yes. um, you know, have a transformation, but want to, you know, like explore, like finding purpose and meaning. Now, according to, to a spiritual science like that of the Bhagavad Gita, it's more based on introspection. So we try to find meaning. The way the world has shown us is that you're finding meaning through external things, right? right? So like, let me go try out hiking. Let me go try out doing this and that, which is great. Like, it's an amazing way to kind of like figure yourself out. Um, but the secret that the Gita gives is don't just, don't start from outside, start from inside. Mm -hmm. And when you start from inside and you get that inner world sorted, then you'll be able to figure out how to maneuver the outer world. So it's kind of like going back to the car analogy. It's like fixing the engine uh, uh, so that the car can run rather than painting the car different color so that the car can run, right? So once you fix the engine, you fix the internal, then the car will be running. Then you can change up the color. You can switch it up. You can do this, you know, whatever you want with it. So similarly, if we go within mm -hmm. and we connect within ourselves, then we figure out who we are, our nature, our propensities, our strengths, our weaknesses. Then we can know how do I apply this in this world that I'm in right now, right? And it's like Maslow, uh, uh, Maslow is like a, you know, yeah, yeah, hierarchy of needs, right? And then he puts self-actualization as like the top of the pyramid. So it's the last thing you should think about. You probably think about basic needs, psychological needs, social needs, etc. Then you think about self-identity. But picture this, if you flip that around, and you figure out who you are first, then you'll know how to deal with your social life. You'll know how to deal with your financial life because you've understood your strengths and weaknesses. And so what the, the Gita recommends is meditation. Mm -hmm. You know, it's such a simple science, a simple way to just go within and revel in your inner space. You know that inner voice? Like, as we're having this conversation right now, there's that voice that you're having inside right. that's kind of like chatting with you your mind. You can see it. You right? can see no, it. Yeah, we all have it, right? <laughs> so that inner voice, getting to connect with that inner um inner Shivani or inner Ian, mm -hmm. you know, who you're having that internal conversation with through something like meditation, especially like mantra meditation, you, you revel in your own being. And then once you're in your being, then you can start becoming, right? So, right. so that's what's recommended. You get into your being by meditating. You know, some people, they, you know, prefer like breathing exercises or different mm -hmm. kinds of meditation. Some people use music as a meditation. Some people use art as a meditation. But finding the best form of meditation for your inner person, your inner right. being and being, then you can become, then you can find your purpose more clearly. Then you'll find something. The universe will arrange to bring you things that work in your area of influence, the things that right. you can be able to tap into just comes automatically once you figure that inner person. I love that. And, you know, I, I've never been somebody who likes to meditate. Mm. I, uh, like I was just telling you before, I will really, really try and I can't do it. But the one place that I've learned that I can is at the temple. Mm. And on a Sunday when I go, I don't allow anyone to come with me from my family. I'm like, please don't come. <laughs> because I just feel like when I go, I like to have that time alone. And I've realized in the last few months, that is the only place I can meditate. Yeah. Because I can turn off and I can swing and I can dance and I don't feel judged. Right. And I can feel happy in that moment. Right, right. If someone is sitting next to me, I'm thinking, do they think I'm weird? Do they think I'm like being a bit crazy? <laughs> yeah, am I, am they... I flowing right? Is my flow right. okay? Right. <laughs> and like one time somebody came and they saw me and they said, oh, well, I hope you're not going to be brainwashed by them. Right? And then that made me feel paranoid that whenever I'm there, and if I know somebody there, or if there's somebody there that thinks that of that of me, then I can't fully immerse myself in that experience. Yeah. Right? Yeah, no, I get that. So yeah. the temple is something for me, which, and I've spoken about this in my videos before, it's something that I like to do for myself. It's something that makes me feel so happy. And there's just an energy there that I don't know. I don't know what it is. Yeah. It just is. And I, I've played all the sounds, at, like all the recordings at home. Nothing is the same than being there for me. I know. And it's I the know. one place that I can just feel free and I don't care. If I, and, and like, as I think I've been going more and more, I feel like I'm starting to care less and less. That's it. Right? That's it. And if, if I could go every day, I would. But I know, you know, one of the, one, one of the things I want to start doing in the summer is going up four o'clock 
Nice, yeah, lucky. coming out in the morning, yeah. Oh, it's just <laughs> so nice. I go every year on New Year's, Eve, New Year's Day. Yeah. I go in at 4 a.m., like the Indian New Year's Day, by the way, not the first. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, okay. The Indian New Year's Day after Diwali. Um, and I go at 4.30 and it's just so beautiful. Yeah. And it's just the best way to start the New Year's, just it to is. get there really early have that start of the day. And I really want to start doing that, actually. Yeah, no, for sure. And you know, you spoke about something really powerful about just getting that time alone. Yes. You know, why is our mind? Because you spoke about the mind as well. Um, one sage, his name is Chanakya Pandit. He talks about the mind. Mm -hmm. And he says, the nature of your mind, your mind's like a monkey. Yeah. But not just any monkey, a drunk monkey. And not even just a drunk monkey. A drunk monkey bitten by a snake and haunted by a ghost. What's that monkey going to do next? That's your mind. Right. Right. So imagine, like, your mind's always going to have so many thoughts. So, you know, you're in the hustle and bustle of living in, you know, London or in the 21st century and you're trying to make it in your life. To get that five, ten minutes alone is practically impossible because your mind is always on a rat race. Mm. Right. So it becomes so difficult. And that's where, like, places like the temple, you know, come into play because you come into a space that is focused on turning you off from that hustle and bustle of, the everyday yes. world and the, you know, the demands and the perfection and the, the standards and, you know, you need to be like this, so you need to act like that. You come to a place that's completely stripped off of that mm -hmm. and you recharge yourself. Right. Then you can go back home and kind of carry on doing your stuff. And then gradually as you carry on, you even learn how to implement that in your own space. So, you know, like mm -hmm. I tell people, like you wake up in the morning, let's say you came up at five o'clock every day or at six o'clock or whatever. Just give yourself five minutes. And in those five minutes, don't do anything, you know, just be in your state of being, you know, right. if, if it means you listen to some nice flute meditation music or some nice lo-fi ready to chill hip hop, you know, and you just zone and be for five minutes, or even if you want to do it two, three minutes and then gradually increase it, getting that time to be with yourself really does wonders. And this is also what the Gita says. The Gita says um, that the sage who has learned to be alone even in the craziness of this world, is the one who's actually most successful, is the one who will actually live the best life. And that's what we need. So you can be able to incorporate these principles and teachings in our own home. Mm -hmm. Even necessarily not have to come to the temple, but I mm -hmm. definitely recommend for everyone yeah, to come everyone to the temple. Go. So you can hang Just out with me. Just not on a Sunday. Don't talk to me because I like <laughs> yeah. to be alone. <laughs> yeah, so we will. Sunday is for us, but you guys can come on the week. I'm no, 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 there. any other time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, so you can always, you know, take that time to kind of, you know, zone in and, you know, be in your state of being because that's your state of being. You're carefree. You don't care about what anyone thinks about you at that moment. You're rocking. You're, you know, you're having a good time. You're smiling. And even if you get emotional, some people are crying. You know, some people wake up and they dance. Mm -hmm. Two left feet, but they're, they're, they're moving and they're not caring how anyone is judging their moves or whatever. And you can just be yourself. So true. Yeah. I remember when my grandma died, every mm -hmm. time I went to the temple, I just used to hysterically cry. I don't know what it was. I just used to get there and I used to just feel so sad. And I remember, I think I used to feel that she was there. Mm. And so when I was there, I used to feel like she's there. And that made me feel sad because I felt her energy. Yeah. Get, get emotional. But, Aww. you know, it's, I think like everyone has a special connection with some place. Yeah. And for me, it really is there. And people, some people don't understand it and that's okay. Yeah. And I think that I've just learned to have a place where I feel safe and for someone else that can be somewhere else. It doesn't have to be a temple. It doesn't have to be a church. It doesn't have to be wherever. Exactly. But, you know, it's a privilege to yeah. have time alone. And That's I love it. spending time alone. That's it. Yeah. I'm a, I just like really need it. Yeah. And I've understood it and I have boundaries in place to make sure no, that, you get that, that I get that time. <laughs> but it is a privilege to have time alone. It you is. know, someone telling you that, you know, I have three kids and I'm a carer, or, you know, I have uh, three jobs, or whatever. I don't have time to have time alone again. Mm. How do I practice mindfulness? How do I start my spiritual journey? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question, yeah, because some people maybe are approaching spirituality at a different stage in their life where they've added so many responsibilities because you can be like you know Ian you decided to become a monk after graduating from uni you right. didn't have a, a you know you, you're not in a relationship you're not married you don't have children you don't have anything like that so um you're you are more fortunate you're more privileged but I'm here I've got you know multiple kids I've got a job and everything and I've only got 24 hours in a day right right now we tell people you know Anything that you value, you put time for. It's a reality. It, 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 it's, it's an, and this is an affirmation that I always stick in. If I value something, I'll put time for it. 
like for example i valued your time and your energy and um the exchanges i had with you so when you invited me to come and have this chat with you i put in the time i'm usually quite super busy on a friday mm -hmm. but i was like you know what i value shivani i value her perspective i value what she's trying to do so i'm gonna you know arrange myself in such a way that i can get some time to do it right. for her so in the same way um if you value connecting spiritually mm -hmm. or connecting or having a sense of connection you will try to incorporate it somehow other in your life like i know this one lady who is fully given her life to um the practice to the practice of krishna consciousness which is you know what we focus on in the temple that i'm based in and she said like uh ian from seven in the morning i'm just answering emails and it's too much but she told me that after every 10 sets of emails i take two minutes to do some mantra meditation on my mantra beats after every 10 sets of emails, that's what I do. So, you know, she's doing like five minutes of meditation after 10 sets of emails, which maybe are taking her like an hour. So after every hour, she's taking like a conscious five minutes, rejuvenating herself, carrying on, rejuvenating herself. Wow. So if one really desires to connect spiritually and is ready to get the right guidance, you can be able to adapt it into your life, however oh, crazy 100%. it is. We have one lady, her, um, a wonderful lady. She's left her body now. Her name is Krishna Nandini. Krishna Nandini was uh, married and had 10 children. And she used to tell us that, you know, because you, know, you usually see us walking around with beads. She would give a lecture and she would talk about how she's got one baby on her back. Another one is crying. Two of them are fighting in the corner. Another one is God knows where I can't even see him. And she's holding her beads and she's trying to still do her meditation. And she felt that even in the craziness of attempting to do it in such a crazy environment, that the divine was reciprocating with her because she tried her best. You see, in the Gita, Krishna says, I don't want you to be the best. I just want you to try your best. So in anything that you try your best in sincerely, he will reciprocate. And so even if you're if in your spirituality, if you actually don't have any time, mm -hmm. you've only got two minutes and you give your two minutes in, in uh, to, to that meditative practice, then you know what the divine does? He makes what would take you an hour to do, take you 30 minutes. Then you've got more time, you know? Wow. And I've seen it with myself. When I started practicing, um, I used to like to give talks because, you know, I've got like serious verbal diarrhea when I get into it. <laughs> um, and so I would prepare for it. It would take me like two, three hours to prepare for a talk. But I always wanted to kind of, you know, like give more and more and more. And then reached a point, then that three hours became two hours. Then that two hours became one hour. So then, then now it could take me like 30, 45 minutes to, you know, get myself in and kind of prepare a talk from beginning to end in a cohesive way, wow. you know, because even Krishna in the Gita says, time I am. So when you connect with divinity, he manipulates time. Divinity manipulates time to work under you because you're trying to use it in service for yourself like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you really do value it, if you value for that, anyone out there who values their spiritual life, and they take even that two minutes, that 30 seconds, it will grow. You can take that principle about valuing anything for, for anything, and yeah. especially in relationships, I've mm -hmm. heard people say this. If somebody wants to be with you, they will make the time for you. Exactly. If somebody wants to book a restaurant, you know, I sometimes get really annoyed when things aren't done. And I'm like, when people are like, I have no time. I'm like, did you go to the toilet? Mm -hmm. Did you poo today? Yeah. Because while you were pooing, you, <laughs> you could have done it. Exactly. You know? <laughs> you know, that's just a simple example. You know, no, yeah. one, no one can argue with me about that yeah. as well. No, legit. I can say you didn't go for a walk or I can say whatever, you didn't eat or whatever. Mm -hmm. While you're eating, your hands could be full. But you know, everyone can make excuses for everything. Exactly. But what you truly want to do, you will make time for. Yeah. It's kind of like how people say I have no money and then people will spend money on things that they want to spend money on mm, right mm. it's what are your priorities what's your focus yeah right? that's actually yeah just based on that I was just thinking there's this one important thing that um we're told as monks is that understand your values your values right. the quality of your values determines the quality of your life so if you value something mm -hmm. and you put your time into it it definitely has a significant effect on how you live but if you don't put strong value onto it, you know, then of course it's not going to have any transformative effect. And so in a relationship, if someone isn't valuing you, it will immediately, you will see it in how they deal with you. And if, mm -hmm. but if someone values you, they'll look at you like Shivani likes this, yes. you know, she, she likes, she wants to organize her life like this. So yeah. I'm going to help her do it because I value Shivani. Right. And then a relationship blossoms because mm -hmm. it's an exchange of values mm -hmm. like that. I really believe that. I focus a lot on like value-based leadership and strengths-based leadership when mm -hmm. I run workshops. Yes. But you know, the way you're speaking, 
is very much as if nothing could affect you. I feel that energy from you. <laughs> that something bad could happen. Yeah. The way you just said, she's not with her body anymore. Mm. You didn't say someone had died. Yeah. Why did you say that? Because she's always going to live on. The soul is always there. It's always existing. Like, And this is why I, I think the reason why I also have that kind of confidence is because of where I've chosen to take my shelter. So I've chosen to take my shelter in the Gita. And the Gita, obviously, we know it's a conversation between Krishna and Arjuna, who's one of his best friends. And um, Krishna gives some very, very powerful affirmations about if, if you put him in a particular position in your life, or if you put divinity in a particular position in your life, divinity will have a certain effect on you. Mm. And to the extent he promises, and he says, do this, and if you do this, I promise I'll take care of you. Mm. And so I think uh, I'm in that situation where I'm trying. I, ca I can't say I'm perfect because bad stuff still happens to to me as well. Mm. You know, I you, and the Gita actually says seasons of happiness and distress must come and go like the waves of the ocean. By using spirituality, you learn how to be steady amidst the bliss and the depression that comes through life. Because also another thing that happens is when good things happen, we get super excited. So right. when something bad happens, we get super depressed. So it's like a constant up and down pendulum, right? And the Gita also talks about detachment. Exactly. So, you know, you by practicing something spiritual and taking shelter of it, you naturally become detached from these waves of happiness and distress. And you'll always be steady. So if something good happens, it's all right. If something bad happens, it's all right. And it's such a peaceful Zen place to be. So what if something great happens in terms of you have a baby? Mm -hmm. Or, um, I don't know. I don't know why that was the first thing that I thought that was. <laughs> is, is that something you're mad about? I, 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 I don't know why that was the first <laughs> thing I, I said. But let's say, okay, let's say it's like, I don't know, I got a one million pound sponsorship for my mm -hmm. podcast. Yeah. Um, should I not be like jumping off the sofa? You could. I mean, it's one way to respond to it. But then if let's say... 20 minutes later, you get a phone call and you're told that, oh, your car, you had, you had your, your car like was involved in like a really crazy crash and you have a bill of like 30,000 that you have to pay mm -hmm. or something like that. I'm just, I just made that up. But that's like the worst know, bad time. Yeah, Let's yeah. say somebody passed away. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. You, oh, yeah. So yeah. Or somebody passed away like immediately after from that bliss to that depression of, of of the person let's say passing away or whatever situation happens is such a great one that will mm -hmm. affect you so bad that you won't even feel the gratitude of the opportunity that you've been given right yeah but you see so for for let's say for someone like me who is on a spiritual path following the guidance of the gita the gita kind of helps you understand that the good and bad that's happening is based on divine grace right so when i always remind myself okay when something good happens okay like shivani's got her her you know million pound sponsorship oh baby yeah <laughs> oh baby <laughs> it's because of divine grace mm. so how can she use that for her benefit or if something bad has happened to shivani it's because of divine grace what is she supposed to learn from it so it puts you in a much more safer position in dealing with the extremities that life will give us right right so you can be overly zealous or overly elated, but you'll also get a point where you'll be overly depressed and frustrated if right. you're always trying to just Chase live in high. yeah exactly chasing that high. But mm -hmm. if you 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 have a purpose to serve, because mm -hmm. service is actually the principle. You have a purpose to serve. Anything that supports your service, you take exactly. it as grace. Anything that deters you from your service, you take right. it as a lesson. And you keep on going, you know, like Aliyah used to say, if you try your best but don't succeed, <laughs> dust yourself off and try, you keep on going, then all the situations will, they'll be always in a, it, it will always be a positive situation for you. you how, would I, how would I cope, though, if somebody passed away that was close to me? And I say that because let's say if somebody in my immediate family passed away mm -hmm. and I responded by saying, it's God's grace. And someone's like, somebody just tragically passed away. Yeah. And you're co and you're not being that affected by it because you believe in God's grace. Mm. People would see me as cold. Yeah. Some people might understand it like that. But uh, now that's when we go back and embrace the teachings of the Gita. So in the Gita, there's a beautiful verse. Oh my God, I love it. I'll, even, I'll actually sing it. Dehino smenyata dehe komaram yovaram jara tata dehantara praptir dhiras tatra namuhyati. Basically, Krishna says, just like this soul like in this body goes through childhood like we're babies at some point right youthhood to old age the soul similarly grabs another body at the time of death yes. and so a sober person is not bewildered by such a change so when i go there i realize actually my loved one 
has just left this body. You know, like when someone dies, we say, or they've left their body, we say they've gone. Yes. Where have they gone? Because the body's still there. So the personality who's within is what's gone. The soul within is what's gone. So that soul that's gone is guaranteed to have itself another situation and circumstance. So the person that I've known and loved is not really gone. They're there just carrying on. It's like they've taken a long trip and I'm not going to see them again, but I know they've taken a long trip in their destiny, right? So I, I'll hold on to the experiences and values that I've had from them. And every day I'll be meditating on the bliss that they gave me and values that they added to my life rather than thinking about them and sulking. Like, imagine this, like, if you're about to leave your body, would you want everyone else to be depressed for the yeah. rest of their lives? Of course not. You'd want them to be happy. Like, I was saying, like, if I died, like, all my homies need to link up and party it out. Like, you know, <laughs> sing and dance. Like, I wouldn't want to leave a negative imprint. So, it, it, so it just, it's a matter of us approaching this real situations with the right consciousness. The Gita says, birth, death, old age, and disease are things we can't avoid. You can't avoid birth. You, you don't even choose it. You know, mm. you don't choose death. You don't choose old age. I mean, we all want to be looking pretty for the rest of our lives. <laughs> and you don't choose disease. You can't yes. control any of these things. They're forced upon us. So because it's a reality that that's never going to change, what, does, what has to change is our consciousness. And so when we take shelter of that statement of, you know, the fact that the soul is ever existing, you know, and mm. never goes. So I know the person who I've lost in reality, I've not really lost. You know, and so why would I lament for something that I've not lost? You because know? we hold on to the body, don't yeah, we? Yeah, because that we body hold on to the physical yeah. experience That's with it. somebody. Yeah. A lot of us are trapped in this idea of hustle culture, mm. and that money is the only thing that will make us happy. And everyone who's rich says, "Don't search for money," and everyone who's poor says, "Well, it's because you're rich." Yeah, and that's why you don't care. Yeah, you don't. You have everything. <laughs> yeah, you don't understand. What you don't it understand. To be like in the you don't streets. get it. Yeah, and there are some people that struggle to put food on the table. Like yeah. the, the cost of living in the UK has gone up so much. Mm. You know, I went to go get milk the other day, and I was mortified. It was, it was like three pounds for a for like not a pint, but you know, like the two liter bottle of milk. Oh wow, crazy! I don't drink real milk, by the way. So yeah, <laughs> don't worry. Oh, it's all right. <laughs> um, but you know, a lot of people will be saying, well. I have to work hard and I have to get money and I have to do these things because I need to survive. You talk a lot about inner happiness and inner wealth. Mm. Tell me how we start searching for that instead of constantly being trapped within this kind of hustle yes, culture yes. or rat race. Yeah, you know, as soon as you were speaking about that, I remember, I don't know, was it one celebrity said this? I think it's George Harrison. Okay. And he said, I wish everyone could have the wealth the success, the money that I've got and live my life to realize that that's not what makes you happy. Jim Carrey said that It's too. Jim Carrey. Yeah. Oh, or maybe Jim yeah. Carrey must have quoted it. Yeah, because I think yeah. also George Harrison said it, you know. Um, But they all say it. Yeah, everyone says it, you know. They I think I also it. saw a video of like, is it Cameron Diaz as yeah. well? In yeah. like a video with like a group of other celebrities just saying like, trust me, it doesn't make you happy. Yes. Because, you know, like what's happiness? It's a constant state of being happy. Now, In, if you're chasing happiness based on external circumstances, external circumstances won't be constant. They'll always be changing. Mm -hmm. So the things that are always changing can't give you happiness because mm -hmm. happiness is constant. Right. Right. The, or the term happiness implies something constant. So from spirituality, we're understanding that happiness can come from what's constant within us, yes. which is our consciousness, our soul, our inner being, mm. which is never going to change. You're the same soul, be it in a flat um, that's like, you know, 300 pounds or be it in your mega mansion that's like 2.5 million. You're the same soul. And this goes know? back to your values. Exactly. Who you are know? you? That's it. Right. So, yeah. So for that person who's maybe trying to hustle and trying to, you know, you know, make it in this world. You're not spirituality doesn't bar you from doing that. If anything, it allows you to do it in the right consciousness because then you stop focusing so much just on the money, but you focus on, you know, doing something that you actually like. Because if you find something that you actually like and enjoy and you're making money off it, it won't feel like a job. Mm -hmm. You know, it will just feel it's something I enjoy doing. Like, I enjoy giving talks. If I can start making money from giving talks, damn, like, <laughs> that's the best thing, of right? Course. You know, because I, I, you're doing so. If people just take that time to focus on their inner space, I feel like it's so important and I would never stop emphasizing it. Meditation, going within, you know, in regardless, regardless of what situation you're in is the best medicine for all of us. Okay, this Sunday I'm going to come early. 
Yes. And we're going to do 10 minutes of meditation together. Lovely. You're going to teach me. Lovely. Because you'll see me. I'll be like, <laughs> are we done yet? Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. And gradually my, we'll get my, ourselves. My mind fine. completely goes. And I think a lot of us in this culture that we live in at the moment, we find it hard to focus. Mm. Ask someone to stay off their phone for a weekend. You can do it. Yeah. Right? Good stuff. Good stuff. It's crazy. And somebody who's struggling with kind of feeling negative thoughts and kind of, you know, we've talked about you don't need to chase the money, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Somebody who's struggling still, how do they reframe their thoughts? How do they change and yeah. get out of this like rut or negative mindset? Yeah. Um, you know, I like because you, you talked about my mind goes, right? Yes. My mind goes. So in one sense, even from the Gita, we learn how to kind of understand that that's my mind going and not me, right? Mm. My mind's gone. It's wandered off into like different negative thoughts, different, but I'm here and I can choose which ones to focus on and which ones not to. And so you start holding the reins. You start to control rather than the mind controlling you because that's what like depressive thoughts do, right? Mm. Like they control your being yes. and they determine your day. But then if you decide and you're conscious or aware about it that, these are my, the thoughts within my mind, but I'm going to be conscious to take the thoughts that are actually positive for me. Then those thoughts actually reach a point. They just say, okay, we're going to sit down and leave you alone. And it's just a thought. It's not you. Mm -hmm. I love that. It's so powerful. We close this podcast now oh. with a nice truth and dare. So which would you like? Truth or dare? I'll go for truth. <laughs> What's the biggest lesson you've learned? throughout your whole journey of being an actor, mm -hmm. of being a monk, and now here? The biggest lesson, oh my, I mean, there's so many lessons, but I can, <laughs> I can boil it down to the main thing that I've learned is that our lives are meant for service. We actually, in one sense, we are most happy when we serve. We are. And instead of always searching, I don't know why that's making me emotional, but you know, when we stop searching to be served, and to try to be the center, and we decide to live a life of serving others, then really we actually live. That's the main thing I learned. Yeah. I wish we had more time. I know, right? We'll I, we, we should two. definitely do this. We again. definitely will do this again. <laughs> I've had so much fun talking to you, and you are somebody who, honestly, I think has like a rim of light around you, and you ooze positive energy. Bless. You really, really do. Yeah, it's it's the people You've I'm around. You've recharged you know? me. Oh, I'm blessed. I'll tell you, like it's like the, my mentors, the people I live with in the temple, the people who are cultivating us. You know, they 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 give me all of this. I can't say that I own all of this. This I can't put the credit to myself. Everything that I am or that I, I I'm being, I'm becoming is a result of all the teachers and the guidance that I'm getting. So. And if you're throwing that accolade to me, I'm throwing it to them because they made me who I am. So thank you so much. Well, you are amazing. And I'll see you on Sunday. Oh, see you on Sunday. Hey, everyone. And thank you so much for listening to this podcast. Wherever you're listening or watching, if you could press the like, follow and subscribe button, it would mean the world to me.